simply changing or embracing the time of day that you exercise can improve your sleep quality. And so Appalachian State University did a really cool study and they wanted to see what time of day, exercising at various times of day, how does it impact your sleep quality? And so they had the study participants to exercise exclusively at 7 a.m. and another phase exclusively at 1 p.m. in the afternoon, another phase exclusively at 7 p.m. in the evening. They compiled all the data and at the end of the study, they found that morning exercisers spend more time in the deepest, most anabolic stages of sleep. So they're producing more human growth hormone. They have more efficient sleep cycles, what we've been talking about. They also tend to sleep longer. And, and this is the one that kind of can get glanced past. On average, they had about a 25% greater drop in blood pressure at night. So what's, what's up with that? That's correlated with a deactivation of your sympathetic fight or flight nervous system, right? So you're actually able to shift gears, get to that parasympathetic rest and digest, calming down by getting some exercise in in the morning. First of all, this is not some woo biology thing. This is grounded in the core of our physiology. There are literally hundreds, if not thousands of quality peer reviewed papers showing that light viewing early in the day is the most powerful stimulus for wakefulness throughout the day. And it has a powerful positive impact on your ability to fall and stay asleep at night. So this is really the foundational power tool for ensuring a great night's sleep and for feeling more awake during the day. The good news is that research shows that cognitive decline is primarily driven by diet and lifestyle factors that you have control over. How does that work? Because if you're only stopping the calorie influx for five days, how does that carry over to sustain change? I don't understand that. I think many people are wondering how, in fact, does just restricting your calories for five days a few times a year have all these long-term lasting benefits? It seems like yeah. too good to be true. <laughs> Well, yes and no. Um, for sure, is going after the visceral fat, right? So we know that the visceral the fat, belly fat. <laughs> yeah, we we, show, uh, we, uh, we know from many other papers that this this belly fat is so central in insulin resistance and all kinds of other problems. And so, of course, after uh, two or three days of, of, of a fasting mimicking diet, we have shown in the paper that everything turns into belly fat consumption. So the body is going after, I mean, that's it, the, the reservoir. That's a food reservoir. What you said was pretty profound. When you do this approach of short-term calorie restriction, you target the fat that causes all the chronic diseases, which is the belly fat or abdominal fat or visceral fat, and not the regular fat around under your skin or the subcutaneous fat. That is a profound, important discovery yeah. because that is the fat that we all need to target that rosemary might actually boost your memory function just by the scent alone. Beets are a great source of naturally occurring nitrate compounds that can actually boost blood flow to the brain. When it comes to your produce, bitter is better. Arugula is so delicious and spicy, it's another great source of those nitrates, and research shows that one single high nitrate meal can actually boost cognitive function. So garlic, like onions and leeks, these are alliums. They're very good for gut health. And what's good for the gut is good for the brain. So I'm gonna load up on some garlic. It also keeps the vampires away. Broccolini is a cruciferous vegetable. Cruciferous vegetables are some of the most detoxifying uh, veggies that you'll find at a farmer's market. Broccoli, cabbage, radishes, Brussels sprouts, all great uh, examples of cruciferous vegetables.